morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to the live program number 119 at Orthodox Principles. Today we have our guest of honor, Dr. Paul Sethi from Connecticut, United States. Dr. Paul Sethi is a clinical associate professor at the Yale University School of Medicine and president of the ONS Foundation for Research and Education at Connecticut, United States. After completing his residence in the Yale New Haven Hospital, he completed his shoulder fellowship at the Colin Job Orthopedic Institute at Los Angeles, California. He's an elite member of the American Shoulder and Elbow Society, Near Circle. He's also program chairman of the ASCS Residence Course. He's been on the AOS Public Relations Committee during the 2011 and 2013, and currently serves as the AOS Shoulder and Elbow Content Committee. Today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Paul Michael Sethi for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. And I'm excited to be on the program, uh, even if I'm only 190 on the list. My topic today will be shoulder arthroplasty, talking about indications, planning, exposure, with some focus on the subscapularis. And really, I want to talk about it in a sports medicine patient and have a bent for the sports medicine surgeon. There seems to be some concern or some lack of adoption of shoulder arthroplasty among many surgeons because it can be difficult. But I would submit to you that the open exposures that we routinely do for open capsule shift, Bristol and Ladder J procedures prepare us well and that shoulder arthroplasty and developing this skill set will make you an even better shoulder surgeon. The sort of patients that we all see and sometimes don't think there's a simple solution to are like this example. This is a 54 year old male. He's a professional, uh, professional in the workspace as an attorney but he likes to play competitive tennis. And you can see he's quite young. He's got an eroded joint space. He's got a large osteophyte or loose body off the inferior, inferior head. And then on his axillary view, his head is completely distorted as is his glenoid. Many of us will look at this x-ray and say, well, there's nothing to do. You're only 54. You'll just have to accept an altered lifestyle. And if that's okay with the patient, then that's okay with me. But many of our patients want to continue to be physically fit manage their stress, manage their blood pressure, and the South Asian population to help manage their blood sugars. And I think we do have tools and assets where we can help this patient when non-surgical options don't work. Here's another example. We in our instability talks love to speak about Bristow and Latterge as a great solution. Our French colleagues will offer this as a first line of surgery for many patients with instability. But 25 years later, there are consequences in many of these patients, not all, but many. And the consequences are arthritis. So now, when he was only 21, we thought of Bristow was a fantastic idea. But 46 comes quickly from all of those who are in the audience. And now at 46, he's arthritic, he's painful, and he's been told, well, there's no solution. Gosh, aren't you lucky you're no longer unstable. And perhaps it's true, he has had 20 years of stability, but now he's got a real loss of range of motion and his shoulder hurts a lot. So once again, do we turn, them, turn this patient away? Do we say, look, you've only had so many cortisone or PRP or whichever type of injection and therapy we wanna give? Is an arthroscopic capsule release and debridement really gonna make a meaningful difference in this patient's life? And the answer is, there is value in all of those things I just suggested, but perhaps at the end of the day, when they've all been exhausted, arthroplasty is something to consider. If we just look at the American data, and this, this doesn't represent all of Asia, and I have a theory on that, we're seeing a large uptick in the requirement for shoulder arthroplasty. And specifically, when we look at the subset of, of sports medicine populations, that purple line on the right graph suggests to you that over the next 20 years, we're going to quadruple the demand for shoulder arthroplasty. Perhaps because we've quadrupled our instability surgeries, I don't know, but nonetheless, these patients, whether they've not seen you before, they're going to see you moving forward. And I would submit that we should have important and useful solutions to them. Just like any other procedure, we wanna talk about what are the pearls and important parts of the history and examination. In considering arthroplasty, I want to know about their age and their occupation and what they're doing. Is this a healthy, muscular person or are they going to be very thin and more cachectic? What are their comorbidities? 
Uh, do they have diabetes? Do they use tobacco? Are they on any kind of chronic pain management, which is less of an issue in Asia, but a big problem in the United States? In fact, we clearly have found that patients who are on long-term chronic pain management are going to have worse long-term results. Some of the pearls that I want to know about are, at least for the, for the arthroplasty, what previous surgeries did they have? Was there any risk of infection? What happened to their soft tissues? And those, in that patient who had a Bristol procedure, I, I'll tell you, it's a much harder arthroplasty. And managing his subscapularis afterwards is going to be a big issue. So as you start to take on shoulder arthroplasty, maybe it's not the ones who've had previous putty plats or previous soft tissue surgeries to their subscapularis that you want to try some of your early primary arthroplasties on. When their external rotation is less than or equal to zero, and it's amazing because someone's scapulothoracic motion can really fool you and they can function pretty well. But as you get more sophisticated in this examination, when you have a patient on the operating room table and you stabilize their scapula and you realize they can only externally rotate to like minus 20 degrees, you have to think carefully about what's happened and how that subscapularis is contracted. Again, I think that the things I'm sort of coming back to are trying to figure out on the history and physical what sort of factors are going to change your ability to do a successful operation. This is probably true of everything that we do, but those are the, some of the subtleties at least I look at in terms of arthroplasty. The most important part of the workup, of course, is x-rays. And a satisfactory axillary view is one of the most critical components. I would argue that it's a critical component of all shoulder, uh, all shoulder care, whether it's instability or arthroplasty. But getting a good look at what's happening on the axillary is critical. There are patterns that we can get used to and see. There's post-traumatic osteoarthritis, and you can see deformity, a little varus deformity of the head. Another pattern is posterior wear. This is a good one to look at. You look at this x-ray and say, oh gosh, look, they've worn their glenoid. Importantly, you can see that the greater tuberosity is really lined up here with the lateral edge of the acromion. It shouldn't be. So that's a trigger that, hmm, something's not right here. The joint is medialized. They, perhaps it's slightly posteriorly subluxed. This view is not sufficient to make any decisions. And it really points out the importance of an adequate axillary view. Of course, we're all now familiar with, with the cuff deficient arthritis pattern uh, and the Hamada classification, which helps us better understand this. But here, of course, you can see a very superiorly migrated head with acid tabulization or even you know, obliteration of some of the acromion. Of course, we recognize here that total shoulder arthroplasty is not going to be indicated. And if the patient will require anything, perhaps reverse shoulder arthroplasty will be a consideration. But again, another common pattern that we see. So x-rays are absolutely critical. What about MRI to check the cuff integrity? Well, I think that's a decision you can make. And if we're going to be cost conscious or our patients are going to have to pay for all of these studies, sometimes you don't have to have an MRI. With previous surgery, particularly previous cuff surgery, I'll probably get one. But in a standard 78 or 80 year old person who comes in with a well-centered arthritic head, I don't know that it's essential because I'm going to cheat. CAT scan. CAT scan is going to become a regular part of arthroplasty. In the United States, CAT scan is much less expensive and much more accessible than MRI scan. And we want to get a CAT scan to understand the morphology or the shape of the glenoid. Walsh described this initially, and now it's been modified to include Ds and Es, uh, but we really want to understand how the head is sitting in the socket and what the pattern of erosion is. Sticking with the early classification and not getting into the weeds, we really see the As, Bs, and Cs. And it's very important to recognize a C early on because that's going to be a more challenging, glenoid deficient, retroverted, or congenitally abnormal. We really want to focus on the, on the Bs and the B1s, 2s, and the more recently described B3, which is acquired deformity, because what we're trying to get at eventually is the ability to put in a glenoid component and seed it well so that it doesn't loosen up prematurely. Understanding the vault of the glenoid and the morphology of the glenoid is critical. Here you can see a CAT scan of a typical B2 where there's a lot of important things to understand here. First of all, this right here where my cursor is, is the normal glenoid height. 
The second thing is that this soft tissue is now accommodated over the years so that this individual is riding on the back half of their glenoid. So as I try to understand this, in order for me to get a flat glenoid in there, I can either take down a lot of this anterior bone and further medialize this, or I can come up with some way to augment the back of this bone with bone graft or a, an augmented implant. Or I can say, you know what? This is so bad. The, the humerus is so far sublux posterior. This is no longer amenable. Someone has gone too far for shoulder arthroplasty. Once again, I take a challenging slide and put something up here that many surgeons will debate for hours on, on exactly what to do, depending upon the patient's demand, age, uh, and, and requirements. But the, the point that I want to make is that getting a CAT scan, while it seems like an extra test, in, in a case where the glenoid is anything other than very normal, I think is going to be an important part. Essentially, all patients get CAT scans. To me, it becomes a roadmap. And as you start to do more complex and more sophisticated arthroplasty, it can tell you where you want to aim, how much you want to take down, how much version you want to correct, and whether or not you're going to require some sort of auxiliary bone grafted or augmented glenoid. And it really is part of your planning in the same way that at some point, each of us would template and image all of our fracture cases and draw out the fracture and the reduction of the screws, we're looking to do the same thing with modern technology and enhancing the software. Uh, and, and the software for most of these is now free or, in, or very inexpensive. Uh, and we just load the CAT scans in digitally. The literature does support the utilization. And we could argue that, gosh, all the guys who write about using 3D templating are the ones who are invested or the developers of it. But nonetheless, I think that in, in, in modern day, if I have a really good GPS or Waze or Google Maps and I'm going from point A to point B, even if I know the way, I may use some augmented or enhanced form of travel. I think that's going to be true in shoulder arthroplasty. When to operate? Perhaps we could spend two hours on this philosophical question just the same. In the, whether it's a hip, knee, or shoulder, the radiographic severity does not tell you when the severity is. There's some sort of appropriate timing when the patient has enough symptoms and the imaging or the, the degree of subluxation and glenoid wear becomes still acceptable in a way that all of us can talk about in a very varus knee, when you start to erode the bone, you get to some point where you say, gosh, this is gonna become a more complex or an unusual knee replacement. Well, in the same way, as you start to get progressive subluxation and posterior erosion of the glenoid, you wanna find a sweet spot where you can get the person the best result. But at the end of the day, as in all of our semi-elective orthopedic surgery cases, the patient decides. And we can try conservative management and physical therapy for a while. I do want to caution on the excessive use of corticosteroid injections, as this has been associated with a higher risk of developing an infection at your ultimate arthroplasty. Similarly, for rotator cuff surgery, as we all recall, the number of injections and the, and the proximity of injection to surgery can also be associated with outcome. We want to follow these patients. Huh probably every year or so, we want to look for bone deficiency. And certainly before you get any indication of surgery, we want to make sure that the rotator cuff has not been compromised or has not given way because that's going to take away the ability, in most cases at least, to do a primary arthroplasty. Pre-op planning. Everything is in the planning. Appropriate planning before surgery is going to help the surgery just be a simple execution of your tasks. You want to figure out what challenges you need to address. You want to make sure you have all the tools in your toolbox that you're going to need to address this. So if you're going to use a bone augment or a glenoid augment, you want to have the right implants there. If you're not sure if the rotator cuff is going to be intact or not, you want to have the reverse shoulder available. You don't want to go into a case not having everything you need. And of course, in your toolbox, you can sometimes consider a hemiarthroplasty or Riemann run type concept. Sometimes you can change your plan on the glenoid and not correct the version um, or just a partial correction with high side reaming. You want to consider if you're going to use bone graft. And if you have, if the patient's not had previous surgery, we can use their own humeral head, augmented glenoids, and once again, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So you've got your first plan going in. 
really the focus of my talk today is going to be on shoulder arthroplasty. And as I break it down, I could probably probably talk about arthroplasty or we could have 10 or 12 hours of lecture on just how to do an arthroplasty, but you'd all fall asleep after a half an hour. So I'll try and break it down. But the simple goal here is to restore the anatomy, right? And by restoring the anatomy, we want to have a, a humeral head that just is slightly or, or less than five millimeters offset from the greater tuberosity. Overstuffing the head or placing it too high is going to lead to some early stiffness and risk for compromise of the rotator cuff. So we want to try and establish what an anatomic uh, rotator, anatomic shoulder arthroplasty will look like. And it's not even wrong to take, as you start doing these, to take a fluoroscopic image uh, before you implant your final implant to make sure you've got your height correct. On the glenoid, we want to get a centered and supported glenoid fixation. In the United States, we're only allowed to use cemented glenoids, although there are some people who are doing bone graft glenoids alone. And what you can see on this cross section here is that this glenoid, this plastic implant is really well integrated and the cement type pressurization here has really caused a nice fit fix. The other thing that's really important is to have a glenoid that sits flush against its implant. So we want to really contour the implant to, to sit and focus uh, and rather to sit and seat very nicely. So every day we want to get to the OR, but Let's get to the OR. Hold on, pause. Remember, get your CAT scan and plan your case prior to going in there, whether it's primary or reverse. There are all sorts of software programs, each made by different manufacturers, and I think they're all quite good. But what you can do is plan this and have a virtual answer for your surgery before. Indicate the surgery, plan the surgery. Now we're gonna get into exposure and talk about humerus, glenoid, and subscapularis, and then hopefully you can win and give the patient a good result. But let's go through this. These are some of the setup pearls that I'm gonna try and choose to do before I make my incision. You can see I've got a bump, bumping the scapula up so that you can expose it and not struggle is very important. So as this video plays, you can see the first thing I'll do is I'll bump the scapula up and I'll bump it up very, very high. Then I'm gonna have an arm board. I don't want the arm to fall into extension because if the arm falls into extension, the anterior deltoid will put more pressure on it. Prep, how do I prep the arm? Well, we're gonna have someone pre-scrub the arm, dry the arm, and then use some sort of alcohol and chlorhexidine combination. Draping, we're gonna drape off the arm very carefully. And this is a good, a good slide actually. What I do on my Mayo stand is I have all the tools that I want set up and they're set up in the order that I'm going to use them. So I'll have Gelfies. I'll have these Richardson retractors and I'm gonna use three or four different sizes of Richardson's to expose what I want. I've got my Fakuda, my Osteotome, my Mallet and my Rongeurs. So my scrub tech is not struggling during my exposure. He or she is getting the re getting ready, getting the back table ready, getting all the reamers ready that I want. So each one of my things set up in the sequence that I'm going to take them is here. I'm very interested in, in maintaining flexion control. Oh yes, I'm sorry, that small homin. That small homin is very, very useful. One, to put on top of the coracoid during exposure. Then it's very useful to put in back of the humeral head to sublux the head anterior. So it's not a full-size total knee homin. It's not one of these baby homins that some of the hand surgeons use, but I like that tool a lot. The next is DARA retractors, and we'll show those uh, right here. These are DARAs, and the DARAs, again, are a very useful tool. Here we've got uh, the Fakuda retractor, um, and then these are going to be the templates. I want to have an irrigation basin. A little chlorhexidine goes in my irrigation basin. The next thing is I'm very interested in infection control. We're going to do a lavage with betadine and, uh, and saline afterwards. And at the end of the case, I'm gonna put vancomycin powder in. So those are some of the secret tips that no one talks about, but I think are very, very useful. Skin incision. Well, we've all done deltopectoral approaches to the shoulder. And here we go, deltopectoral, I'm gonna spread the skin and I'm gonna identify the vein very slowly. I'm gonna, we can debate for, again, for, for time, whether you wanna bring the vein laterally or immediately, both are acceptable. Perhaps you have a lower risk of injuring the vein when you bring it medially during the case, but there are a lot more crossers and it takes more time to expose. 
The most superior part of the incision, this is uh, a recess, uh, is where you can see a really clear fat stripe and get into the delta pectoral interval without struggling that much. I'm sorry to use my finger in a surgical exposure, but I think that releasing the subdeltoid space, especially in those patients who have had surgery, is a critical component of trying to get your, your releases and get your humeral head to deliver. So the next thing is to identify the pectoralis tendon. So here it is. There's the pectoralis. Here's the muscle belly. And here's the tendinous component of the pectoralis. This Richardson retractor will expose it down. I'll release a centimeter to a centimeter and a half, depending upon how rigid they are of the pectoralis. I'm being careful and mindful of the biceps just below me. But now what I'll do is I'll sew. Here's the edge of the pectoralis. Tendon. I'll sew the biceps into the pectoralis right here. That's the pectoralis and do my biceps in the during my exposure. I just get this part out of the way. You could consider a tenotomy, but I think that if you're sitting there looking at it, it's two inexpensive varicose sutures. And if you can reduce the risk of a cosmetic deformity here, even though this patient population doesn't always care, it's nicer. And the younger football coach or the attorney or tennis player, they will care. So right there, I'm sewing with two varicose sutures. The, uh, the pectoralis to the biceps, uh, and I'm going to then release the biceps right over there. Assessing and addressing the subscapularis. Every orthopedic shoulder meeting goes over this for hours and hours. We talk about a, a tenotomy, we talk about a peel, and the, and the more recently popularized lesser tuberosity osteotomy. All of them are viable, all of them are reasonable, and all of them probably have a role in, in the surgical procedure. The tenotomy, about a centimeter medial to the uh, bicipital groove. It's straightforward. It's easy. The question is, is, can it heal? And is the strength of the repair, a tendon to tendon repair, as beneficial, as strong? Appeal, unlike doing a tenotomy, appeal is when you take it right from the lesser tuberosity and you peel it all up. You have the ability to medialize the tendon a little bit because you've got a, a long, probably 18 to 20 millimeter footprint of tissue there. Once again, we have the concern of having a rotator cuff heal back to bone, whether that's the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, the subscapularis more anteriorly, the knock on any of these tendon release surgeries is tissue healing. Well, here's an example of how to do a, uh, a, a peel. So what you can see is this is a, this is a view when we're just grabbing control of the subscapularis with a suture right there. The uh, lesser, uh, rather the bicipital groove has been marked out this is that Dara retractor going into the rotator interval, and that's just going to apply tension. And using electrocautery, uh, you can come down and release along the subscapularis, so you can peel down and get all this tissue. What you can do then is in a big sleeve, you can come down around the neck. You're using, again, this Dara to look at the inferior aspect of the neck right there, and there's the osteophytes. You're going to release the osteophytes, and look, you've come all the way around the inferior capsule. Down here, you're going to see the latissimus tendon. It actually, unlike the latissimus, when you have to release it and transfer it, it looks thick and robust. So that's going to be your inferior margin marker to stop. And you've taken capsule all the way around or release capsule all the way around so that you can really expose it and see that head. Osteotomy. Osteotomy, of course, has the benefit of having bone to bone healing. And as orthopedic surgeons, we like putting bone against bone. So here's an example of osteotomy. Again, the exposure is identical. You've got the lesser, uh, rather the bicipital groove cleaned out, subscapularis tagged in the same way. But in this case, using an osteotome, a thin sliver osteotome, or sometimes an oscillating saw, depending upon your preference, you can start out and just make a thin slip. You do not want to take a big, large osteotome, right? You don't want to take a big, a huge amount of bone. The arguments are sometimes it's a wafer, but it really is just a a five millimeter thin portion of bone. And in the same way, once you've sort of released this, then you're gonna come around the inferior neck of the humerus, lever it off, and then release any residual adhesions into the rotator interval. And then you have to release right down here, the same way you're gonna release this capsule all the way down towards the latissimus, and then really identify and get this inferior neck exposed. The nice thing about a, an osteotomy is that in a tight or a difficult exposure case, it may give you a few extra millimeters of, uh, of bone to use. And I would suggest that you practice this. You can even practice it when you're doing reverse shoulder arthroplasty, where the healing of this isn't as critical. The advantage uh, additionally of osteotomy is that you can see 
your osteotomy healed onto bone. And if it does start to fail or it does start to transfer, you're going to see that your osteotomy moved. Now we can, we can talk about in the discussion section, well, what do you do when you see it move? Uh, well, that really depends. It can become, become its own issue. But this is an area of controversy. Do you do a tenotomy? Do you do a peel or do you an oste osteotomy? Well, what are the biomechanics? Well, biomechanically, this has been really studied very, very carefully. And it seems that biomechanically, at least osteotomy seems to have some advantage. Uh, tenotomy and the peel having the least ideal biomechanics. Krishnan says LTO is the strongest. The Rush group says, well, the biomechanics of all three are actually quite, quite reasonable. And then at Mayo Clinic, again, he says that tenotomy says, well, maybe tenotomy is actually acceptable. So if you're saying to me, well, I don't know, not being clear on biomechanics, which I should do, the answer is that's correct. I'm not being clear because I think we can find literature to support whatever our personal belief is. Left questioning. Let's break it down to peels versus osteotomies. Well, this is actually a randomized trial from, uh, from George Atwal in Canada. And what he did is he looked at subscapularis strength and he followed that over two years and he compared the two and gosh, it didn't look very different. And then he looked at ASCS scores between the two groups and gosh, it, it didn't look very different. Constant scores between the two groups. Once again, it didn't look very different. What about healing rates? Um, uh, was there a statistical significance in healing rates? No. So a, a lot of the uh, the promise of behind osteotomy really didn't sort of pan out, at least in this one study. So really, if you break it down, looking at osteotomy versus peel, strength, no real difference. Outcome scores, ASCS, constant healing rates, no difference. So the take-home message is that a difference makes that makes no difference is no different. What am I trying to say? The data is not cleared. But let's look at tenotomy versus lesser, tubi lesser tuber osteotomy. So is there a difference between peel versus a tenotomy? The, the, the group at Columbia University read by, led by Bill Levine did a one-year follow-up and had no difference in range of motion or outcome studies. Their subscapular strength going out to two years, no difference. Their outcome scores, WUS, ASCS constant score, no difference. So Peel versus LTO, tenotomy versus LTO, tenotomy versus peel. For those of you who don't follow the American rap uh, industry, this is uh, the band called the Digital Un Underground. And they sang a song called Do What You Like. And honestly, whatever you choose to do, do it well and be methodical. But it seems at least in the current data that there's no huge difference and, uh, and that's more to be discovered. The glenoid exposure. The glenoid exposure is a very challenging part of the case. And really what you wanna do is put the retractors in and do the correct releases. It is important to get the, the pectoralis release and the subdeltoid release done very, very well so that it allows your glenoid release or your glenoid exposure to be done more easily. The third part of glenoid exposure is subscapularis release. We wanna do 270 degrees. So here we have the subscapularis tag and I'm coming on top of the subscapularis and I'm reaching into the rotator interval and releasing the superior and the middle glenohumeral ligaments on the top, off the top. It's very important. You can almost feel them pop and release. As you get close to the glenoid, I might use a bovi because there are a couple of small bleeders that are just easier to get. From inferiorly, you're gonna to wanna to do an inferior release and you're gonna place, you're gonna place a, a retractor along the front of the glenoid and really come along hugging, hugging the bone. Don't wanna get down too far into the capsule there. It can be dangerous. And really, I don't know if you need to release along the posterior aspect of the glenoid. Some surgeons will do it, some won't, but you have to consider your soft tissue balance. And if you're significantly posteriorly subluxed, it's probably not required. Important, look at the retractors. Anteriorly, we have a bank cart retractor. Superiorly, we can have a homin, or you can have two small bank cart retractors, or you can have a homin off the bottom. You want to make sure you have an anterior capsule release. Sometimes you can use a Fukuda off the inferior side if you're really not getting what you want. And you can really toggle between the small, uh, the small baby bank carts or Batman type retractors or the Fukuda. And sometimes you need one for one and one for the other. Um, after you, you've gotten through, you want to make sure you have an appropriate inferior capsule release. So here's subscapularis. Here's this inferior capsule. Here's a, a snap reaching underneath the inferior capsule. 
You can release this and release it all the way up along the subscapularis. This is important. Once again, I don't want you to go digging in the axilla because that could be trouble, but the inferior capsule is a sharp bend that you will feel. Another long topic of discussion is, well, how much can you really correct? After what point in time is correction going to be not useful or are you going to have penetration or perforation of your glenoid implants? And what happens if you don't correct? Really to sort of sum it up, I think beyond 15 degrees of retroversion, you're, you're going to have a harder time not perforating. The amount of correction that you do is, is a topic of debate, but it seems you want to get it between zero and 10 degrees in the majority of cases. What's probably most important is at the end of the case, when you trial your humeral implant with the glenoid implanted, that you have the appropriate amount of subluxation, about 50%, that the head doesn't slide out the back. The second important thing is the glenoid is well seated. There are so many small nuances on how to get the, the version exactly correct, but the other component is that you don't want to take down too much bone. As you ream and you remove more bone, typically anterior, to get a flush glenoid, you eventually get into the subchondral bone. And that subchondral bone is not strong enough and can, the glenoid can continue to medialize even when well implanted. The whole implant can continue to medialize and the bone won't get supported and you could eventually have failure. So it's this really delicate tap dance between how much to go medially versus how much to, to get this well seated. When you go back to your CAT scan, if you looked at your classification, you've got your A's, they're easy, they're straightforward. You wanna flatten it out. Your early B's, you can sort of, you can also do well with that a lot. And when you get into the B twos and threes, this is when you debate, how am I best going to seat this? Am I gonna high side ream it? Am I gonna augment it? Am, am I gonna accept some increased amount of retroversion? And the C type glenoids, well, this is its own discussion, um, but sometimes you can't put a glenoid in there. Sometimes you're going to use something as simple as an inlay or a partial correction. The final reward that you have here is a straight shot, a straight look at the glenoid as you get ready to prepare it. And look, if you can't see it, you can't fix it. So going back, rechecking the pec, rechecking the subdeltoid, making sure the subscapularis is released, making sure you have enough exposure. This is what you need to do over and over. To, to get this right. You don't need curved reamers and drills typically. Once the glenoid is exposed, you're going to drill holes in it. You're going to put your trial on it and your trial is gonna let you know that you're adequately seated. And then finally, you get your implant in and you start to smile because you know what? You know you've got the first major hurdle of this operation completed, a well-seated glenoid. Once your glenoid is seated, well, I'm jumping ahead, but I want to prepare on how I'm going to repair this, this uh, subscapularis. Transosseous tunnels, I think, are critical, whether you're doing osteotomy, tenotomy, or peel. And then there are many different devices that you can use to incorporate. Here, here this does have a bony fleck, but what, they, what I have here is transosseous uh, holes, where I'm going to sort of set this back into place. Once it's set back into place, I'll continue to suture repair. There are small plates, there are multiple different devices on how to get this uh, subscapularis and osteotomy back into place. And the short answer is that you just need to be methodical and do it well. It is not three simple stitches. It is often six or seven or eight stitches, maybe three transosseous, but really a lot of work afterwards. And your goal at the end is to have a well-seated implant that has an appropriate height and appropriate version um, where the head is lined up and stays balanced within. And here you've actually gotten augmented glenoid. For me, in the young appropriate patient, this is an outpatient procedure. LTO versus a, uh, versus a tenotomy is going to be what I do. The sling is about six weeks. Start PT early. Well, you know, I don't know. Sometimes the patients aren't as sophisticated. You can start early, but I think you can also wait up to three or four weeks. My colleague Patrick Denard is started, starting to convince me that I can wait. And we have a graduated rehabilitation program many of which are available online. Low demand sports at around three or four months and high demand by six months. Some of the new topics that we continue to get excited about are stemless arthroplasty. There are many commercially available stemless arthroplasties. And the argument is that this implant in a younger person may conserve bone better. And in the ultimate need for revision surgery, uh, this may be a nicer thing. It's, they're, they're not very difficult to remove when you have to do conversion. And yes, I've done that. Um, I think that as, as the markets even out and as these implants become the same price 
as the stemmed implants, this will become an equally attractive option. The other thing that's sort of fancy and new uh, and I alluded to through the talk is what kind of augmented glenoid and whether you have a wedge glenoid, whether you have a half wedge, whether you have a big step or even a metal back convertible, these are all going to be issues that need to continue to get resolved. There is some exciting five-year data out on many of these, but we want to see 10 and 15-year data. And the argument for using an augmented glenoid is that we can use and preserve more bone, perhaps get less early loosening. We can restore a native joint. Um, and bone grafting can be hard, especially in revision cases when we don't have native bone. The outcomes, well, look, the outcomes of primary shoulder arthroplasty in the older patient population are quite good. This is a Norwegian registry. And as we look at our younger sports medicine patient population, they actually do very well. It is, it is important to recognize that, that younger patients do have a less, of, less of a survival rate than a patient who's in their 70s and 80s, uh, who are going to put less demand on the joint. But nonetheless, I think you can expect satisfactory outcomes. So on my last slide, my closing thoughts are that it's important to remember that young active patients can do well after anatomic shoulder replacement. You have to have meticulous surgical technique. You have to preserve uh, and not injure your rotator cuff. You want to preserve and maintain your, your glenoid. Um, I think that patients, they tend to self-titrate their activity. They get back to their level of activity. And I tell them, look, don't go back to chopping wood or doing rigorous work or wrestling. Remember, indicate well, plan well, expose the humerus, get the inclination and the version correct. Get the glenoid well seated and the glenoid version correct. The subscapularis, choose what you like, but fix it well. And at the end, you can get a win for your patient. And that's my last slide. And I think now we can go to any questions if there are any. Thank you, Paul, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, brilliant overview on total arthroplasty. And I really like the slide that you said with all the retractors and instruments in place. And that's, the, uh, that's one of the key points in the presentation. A uh, few questions. Uh, see, you like to cement the glenoid and leave the stem uncemented, isn't it? So th that's correct. In the United States, our FDA recommends, or we don't have a, we don't have a, a, a regulation to have a completely uncemented glenoid. I do typically bone graft the central peg, and I'll cement the uh, the peripheral pegs so that I have some sort of hybrid fixation. Uh, I haven't had the courage yet to go over to completely uncemented glenoid, although I know many surgeons do. As far as the humerus goes, we initially, we initially cemented all the humerus, uh, but really have moved over to essentially non-cemented humerus for me, even in, in the majority of fracture cases. So I can keep the cement out of the humerus pretty confidently, and perhaps I'll need to become more avant and learn more cement-free techniques on the glenoid. The other question is regarding the stem length. I'm not talking about the hemi cap or the grease, uh, hemi, uh, the capping procedures. The stems that you have shown are relatively shorter compared to those ones which were available earlier. So, do you think that makes a difference? So, uh, probably not. Uh, I think whether you go to a completely stemless, a short stem, or a long stem, I suspect that, th that there's no real difference in outcome, with the exception of having to remove the stem later on. I, I think. For a primary arthroplasty, it's metaphyseal fit and metaphyseal rotation. When you talk about reverse shoulder arthroplasty, where there's a lot more torque on the proximal stem, it's going to be very important to have strong, good metaphyseal bone to hold that reverse into place. Um, but if at any point I think that I'm not getting appropriate fixation, I'll go from the shorter stems that I showed you to a longer stem uh, intraoperatively. Uh, and it's just about getting a good time zero fit to me. And I think compared to a lower limb arthroplasty, the upper limb makes a lot of difference because it is not weight bearing and you're not consider you're not worried about acetabular or the glenoid component wear, is it? So uh, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a non-weight bearing joint, but some of the nuances, and of course I'm biased because, you know, knee surgery is easy for everybody, but this is shoulder surgery, you know? Um, but I, I think that it's very important to get the subscapularis uh, and, and the seating in the glenoid exactly right, because it can't it can't really settle into place as nicely as an acetabulum might. Now, of course, I'm teasing. I, I know that the lower limb surgery is e equally complex. The other thing is, suppose you've made a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So would you think of using a reverse total shoulder as a primary procedure? Because you're, 
invariably the cuff is going to be damaged in almost 75% of patients? I think that's a highly intelligent question. Um, and the answer is maybe. So in a person who's got advanced rheumatoid arthritis that's poorly controlled on a lot of medications, uh, when I go to ream their glenoid and it's just soft, soft bone, then I'm going to be very, very cautious about putting in a, a primary shoulder. Furthermore, if they're maintained on prednisone, right? But nonetheless, I think with the, the new world of biological medications, where we have far fewer rheumatoids that come to arthroplasty, and those that, that do sometimes are actually well-controlled, so it's not a must, right? You know, if they're 87 years old, maybe I, I will lean towards this reversomania. But if, they're, if they have reasonable bone and reasonable tissue, it's not wrong, but it's certainly a consideration in every case, whether or not I want to be back there to fail, face a failed rotator cuff tear or a loss of glenoid uh, fixation because of bad bone. The other question is regarding the dream and drum technique popularized by Prof. Frederick Matson from Seattle. Do you have any experience uh, on using that? I, I do have some. Certainly, I don't have Dr. Madsen's experience. And, and he's got, if you go to his website, I mean, his videos are just fantastic. He's got people water skiing and Hope Solo, who is our famous American uh, women's goalie. So I, I, I've done Riemann runs and I've done them in two settings. One, in patients who I think are going to be non-compliant with a post-operative course. And then two, in, in a young patient who has no rotator cuff that I'm not ready to do a reverse on. What I found in the Riemann runs is that it takes a while you know, six or eight months for them to get, get their relief. My shoulder arthroplasty uh, patients, they have less pain than they did preoperatively within two weeks, right? They don't have full motion. They've still got a lot of rehab to go, but they have less pain immediately. The Riemann run, I think it really has to settle in. I think the glenoid has to get a little uh, fibrotic and form, form a little bit of a rind. Um, and I think that the range of motion isn't quite the same. So if we compare, if we compare outcomes of hemiarthroplasty to total shoulder arthroplasty. It seems that the outcomes of, of total shoulder arthroplasty are going to be across the board better, but in the exact small subset, if you have someone, a South Asian guy who's wrestling still and really getting after it, that would be the indication. Um, if pain relief is the primary goal, probably primary re replacement is going to be a better outcome. When you talk about dream and run, you're not, uh, you're just dreaming and living the, like that, isn't it? You're not putting a DNA component at all, isn't it? No, you're not, you're not doing any support. You're just trying to remove, remove sort of any unevenness. You want to keep a flat glenoid. You're using a mismatched reamer of humeral head size relative to glenoid size, and you're trying to create a fibroblastic response back on the glenoid side. So it's basically a kind of hemi it, 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 is, it is exactly that. Okay. The other question is regarding, uh, see, whenever we, most of the uh, arthritis is uh, starts with a posterior glenoid wear. So do you think there's a role for arthroscopic glenoid plasty where you're changing the, uh, reducing the posterior wear and making it slightly uniform as an interim procedure before you really go ahead with the total shoulder later? So uh, when the patient comes in in their 30s and 40s or maybe late 40s, and I saw just another one this week, he came in and was told to have a posterior label repair. Um, and he's 46 years old and didn't have a trauma, has no instability. And I, his MRI has a posterior labral tear, but he's also got a sublux humeral head and his articular cartilage is starting to come out the back. So all that's going to do is tighten his shoulder up and causes arthritis. So if you could find a patient in that age group and, and do a capsule release and try and rebalance them, but the challenge of trying to do any kind of glenoid plasty is that you're removing any articular cartilage. So, uh, I don't know if we can beat the natural, by the time the natural history shows itself to us, I don't know if we can really beat it. Um, there might be some interim procedures that you can try arthroscopically in the young group. Uh, and in some patients will work, but it, it really, it's very hard for me to determine who's gonna be successful in the same way that I've done interposition arthroplasties and had some really fantastic results. Um, I've also had some really miserable results too. Thank you, Paul. The other question is in the initial slides that you showed about a coracoid transfer, that is the Bristol that you mentioned producing arthritis. How common is that? Do you, with the modern, I mean, lethargy and which I mean, principally the same? Uh, because I do a few lethargy, so I'm really concerned that how many of them are going to get arthritis? So, well, you, you're going to have to live, uh, live 25 years later with these patients and hope that they, they have moved away. 
There's one study from the United States Navy that looked at, at, at cadets who had had surgery, and 25 years later, there was about a 30% chance of arthritis, uh, at least radiographically. But I have to tell you, at least in the American population, latter J or Bristol is usually a, a secondary or a tertiary procedure. It's not always done as a primary procedure. So these patients already have articular cartilage changes or are already missing some of their bony anteriorly. So I, I suspect a lot more of these are going to have arthritis than we're willing to admit or own up to. And it's a hard group of patients to track because they're going to be very mobile from the time they're 20 to when they ultimately require arthroplasty at 40 and 45. And do you think there is a significant difference between those who undergo a bunker developing arthritis and those, de those who are doing a lethargy developing arthritis? So again, I think if you're talking about primary operation versus primary op operation, probably not. Just in the same way, you know, once you have an ACL tear, you've got some risk of arthritis because of the injury itself. Um, but in the patients, typically the patients who are going to have ladder J's are going to have second and third procedures done. So if you parse out that subset, the primaries are probably going to be similar, but the ones who've had revision surgeries are going to have higher rates. And uh, see, when you do a lethargy, you're not placing, of course, you're increasing the range of, I mean, the range of arc, but what you're keeping is uh, not a cartilage there, is it? So is that the reason why you're getting slightly higher incidence of arthritis? No, I, look, I think that e even in the best days, sometimes our, our bone plug is a half a millimeter too lateral, right? Uh, I think that the screw heads can move. I think there can be hardware complications. I think you've instrumented the glenoid with, uh, with metallic tools. There's a lot more than just, than just having a perfect x-ray at the end. Uh, Paul, you know, one of my very good friends, uh, uh, Dr. Sentinel Sambandham, who's a staff orthopedic surgeon in Texas, uh, is also in the room. He does a lot of arthroplasties. And uh, Sentinel, do you have any questions to Dr. Paul? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, nice talk, Paul. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, so I, I work in the VA and we have some really big patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I've had, uh, in some places I worked, I have partners who sometimes release the pec major more than a centimeter, almost like three fourths of the pec major or even for a whole of it and repair it. And sometimes they take the anterior deltoid from the clavicle, erase it a little bit and reattach it. So have you ever had to do something like that in really big uh, athletic, very muscular deltoid, big males? So you, you describe the patient who gives me chest pain when I walk in. If they have a big, strong deltoid, you just know that every part of the case is going to be a struggle. Um, and, and typically it's that patient, the, the, the VA patient who's had previous surgery for instability and, you, and, and they've just, they're tough and they wait until their arthritis is really bad. So absolutely, I have no compunction about releasing more of the pectoralis. We did a study a number of years ago when I was studying bicep synodesis and I was amazed the pectoralis could be eight to 10 centimeters long in some patients. So if you have to release a little bit more and then re and, you know, put one or two stitches back into it to repair it, there's there's nothing wrong with that. As far as going up to release the deltoid off of more proximally, um, I, I typically don't get there, but I find that putting a Holman retractor on the base of the coracoid and really levering up there, it gets me there. But once again, I think those are two additional nice solutions on how to expose deep, complex glenoids and the humerus at times that that can be useful. So so Dr. Sentel, I, I like both of those, and I and, and I think that. I would easily do either of them if I need. I want to see and expose before I instrument. Okay. The uh, other thing is every surgeon has his own set of, other than the posture, like a uh, humeral head subluxing more than 50% when they're checking stability. Uh, everybody has a set of things they check to say that, oh, I'm happy with the components. So what's your routine? So uh, are you talking about intraoperative or preoperative? Yeah, intra, intra, intraoperative, intraoperative so stability. So look, I, I want to, uh, once my glenoid is implanted, I want to look at my, my, the balance of my humerus and I want to posteriorly sublux my humerus and then internally rotate my humerus, right? And if I internally rotate and it falls off the back of the glenoid, I'm, I'm upset. Something has gone wrong. I, I didn't ream properly. I've done the version wrong. Um, I, I don't love it when I only get 10 or 15% when it's really snug and I'll wonder if I can use a less thick humeral head because I want some free motion there, but it's really internal rotation. And, you know, look, I'll take up to 75 or even 80% subluxation of the humeral head without the subscapularis on, as long as it doesn't fall off the back with internal rotation. If it does, 
Um, then what I might do is I might, I might change the version of my, of my humerus by four or five degrees, antiverting it. I might use the offset of an eccentric humeral head and rotate it a little more anteriorly, balancing that without, you know, without sort of overdoing, overdoing my subscap. And when I'm really in trouble and, I, and I've sort of not, it's not working, I'll put a purse string suture in the back of the capsule and keep them in external rotation for three or four weeks. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't feel good when I do that. And I'm sort of hoping for the next four or five weeks that, that they're going to be okay. What about you? Um, yeah, that's pretty much I, uh, I do, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like if it's a uh, subluxing posteriorly, then uh, I, I, yeah, like I don't plicate the capsule as much as possible, you know. Uh, one thing I've noticed in shoulder is uh, it's like a medial uni between leaving it too tight and too loose. Uh, are a little loose. I would prefer a little loose rather than tightening the shoulder too much, you know. Uh, so I will take a little bit up to 75% translation as long as it doesn't go there and stay there, you know. So um, that's my experience. Uh, uh, yeah, but I don't do a posterior soft tissue application. Uh, you know, I don't know uh, how well it's going to hold, you know, so. I, I, I agree with everything you said. Looser is better. Okay, Central, any more questions to Dr. Paul? No. No, I think I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sethi, for joining in. It was a, a fantastic ex experience. And uh, I think the audience have really benefited. It's going to go global and it's there all over the world. And thank you for spending your valuable time. And we we'll really look forward to one more lecture from your side whenever you have time later on. Thank you so much, both of you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, you very too, much. Dr. Sethi. Bye. Thanks, Sethi.